Divine Truth Theme Discussions Discussions between Jesus and Mary about specific topics and issues. This is session 14, part 1 of the discussion God's Laws of Forgiveness and Repentance, where Jesus and Mary continue to discuss God's principles and laws of forgiveness and repentance, focusing on the role God has and how God is and can be involved in our personal processes of forgiveness and repentance. The session was recorded on the 17th of April, 2018, from 10.30 a.m. in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia. Welcome, everyone. This is session 14 in a series that Jesus and I are discussing about God's laws to do with forgiveness and repentance. Today. So hi, darling. Hello. <laughs> yeah, 14 sessions so far and probably, Still going. probably a few more yet. Yeah. <laughs> we said last time, I think, that we were only going to do one more, but it's looking like it would be a couple more maybe. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> so today we're going to focus on what is God's role in forgiveness and repentance. So we've spoken already a lot about God's laws and various other matters, but now we really want to focus in on God's role and how God can be involved in our personal processes of forgiveness and repentance. Mm. Interesting subject. Yeah, Mm. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) All right. So firstly, we're going to do a bit of a quick review this time. Obviously, you've heard many reviews before now. So we're just going to do just a very fast review so that you've got a, a bit of an idea of what we've already discussed. Now, if you haven't listened to the previous sessions, We recommend that you do listen to those previous sessions because otherwise you won't really know what we're talking about today. (laughs) But uh, remember in the first three sessions, we discussed God's uh, laws generally, God's truth generally, and how we can determine God's truth about forgiveness and repentance. And then we discussed the processes of forgiveness and repentance and and sort of what they feel like and how they're engaged with emotion as well. So they were the primary points that we discussed in those first three sessions. That's a very quick review of 12 hours of material. (laughs) Yes, and that's right. That was the foundations, wasn't it? And then Mm. we realised or we knew that we needed to give some other context to this whole discussion. So in sessions four to eight, we discussed specifically the laws of compensation that God has operating to assist us to come to this point of desiring to engage forgiveness and repentance. Mm. And then, uh, of course, we had we started that very interesting discussion that we've had with you about the conscience, which began in session nine and has continued through to last week, session thirteen. And hopefully, by now, you're getting to be see a bit of a picture about what the role of that inbuilt mechanism is for. Uh, God, it's the mechanism that God has inbuilt into the human soul to allow God to transmit truth to the human soul, as long as that soul, of course, is open to receiving that truth. And, and of course, we've discussed a lot of the ways in which you can open up your soul to allow for that conscience mechanism to work very well. Mm. Mm. So it almost feels to me like we've come a bit of a circle. We started out with God and these very uh, lovely processes of forgiveness and repentance. Then we saw how we, we're being prepared all the time to to begin to desire to engage them and now i feel like we're back here in session 14 talking about god and the actual pure process of forgiveness and repentance yes and 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 in particular today we want to focus our attention on just the part that god plays in forgiveness and repentance because there are some significant roles god plays both uh, from a direct perspective and an indirect perspective so we want to discuss those particular roles that God has. And that's different to what God's feelings are about it. Mm -hmm. So in the next session, we'll discuss the feelings that God has. Yeah, and Mm. and also it's different from really what we do. It's really what God is doing. Mm. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to the discussion. (laughs) Yeah, it should be interesting. Yeah. (laughs) So God's role in forgiveness and repentance. Obviously, from what we've already discussed so far in the previous 13 sessions, we can see that God has a hand in everything that we've been discussing. So Mm. God's already involved in this process, whether we're consciously aware of it or not, isn't Mm. he? Yeah. 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 But now we'd like to talk about some of the specific 
mechanisms and specific ways that God is involved, sort of almost more personally, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, well, God's obviously very personally interested in whether we do go through forgiveness and repentance or not. Mm. And uh, after today's discussion and the following one, we should be able to see quite clearly that God has a high level of personal interest Mm. in whether a person, one of his children, goes through these two processes. And that's very moving in itself, isn't it? That Mm. God is personally interested in each of us going through this process. So so in what ways is God attempting to assist us to uh, repent for our sin or to forgive the sin in others? Well... (sighs) We probably should break these ways down into four primary ways, and and you could call them four primary groups of ways, really. Uh The first group, grouping of ways that God helps us is in a direct personal way. So we want to discuss firstly what it means, how does God help us directly and personally. And when I say personally, I'm saying specifically that God has a personal thing going on with you, whoever you are (laughs) in the world, and whether, no matter what your condition, God's, and and even doesn't matter whether you believe in God or not, Mm -hmm. but God's got a specific thing going on with you to help you go through these particular processes. And God's interested in you going through the processes for the sake of your own happiness. So, Mm -hmm. you know, that's a very important thing to bear in mind. So there's these very direct personal ways. That's the first group of things that we need to discuss. The second group of things we need to discuss is more about um, that God has relationships with with other people other than ourselves, you know, because depending on our development and also our ability to listen to God is the is what depends upon whether God has a close relationship with us or not. Mm. So no matter what kind of relationship God has with us, it could be closer. And, and oftentimes there are other people who are closer. And so what God does is also tries to get those people who are closer to God. Mm-hmm. Uh, they have entered an agreement, many of them with God, that they want to help the people who are not yet close to God. And so God has, and these particular people are, are assisted by God to help each individual who, who is on earth or in the spirit world who needs that help in a personal and direct way. Mm. So, so you could say God is, is the second method or group of methods is how God engages uh, giving assistance to people who haven't got a direct connection with God. Uh, and even those who have are also helped using this method. Mm. So this is the second group of methods. So the first one is God and me direct. Yep. The next one is... With no intermediary, no... No ex- external help, mm. just God and you. Mm. Yep. And then the next one is God has relationships with other people that are more close or closer than my relationship with God. And God, in ways that we'll discover, influences those people to assist me in the forgiveness. Yeah, repentance not process. only the influences, also directs them directly. Yep. You know, there are clear directions given to mm. them about how they can assist you so mm. so there, there's a and and also the the people who are chosen to assist you usually have uh, had a history of specific issues and problems that you currently face so that they can have compassion for your circumstances and situations so it's very personalized assistance yeah. that god directs there yeah, yeah. awesome yeah. all right there's a the third one what was the third one well, you could say the third one is the indirect assistance that God gives us via God's laws. So every one of, remember that every one of God's laws has been constructed specifically to assist the thriving and, you know, not just the survival, but the thriving and growth of the soul. Yes. So, so every law has been specifically created to assist a person to develop and grow. And that means every law also, to a degree, has been specifically created and particularly the moral and ethical laws and the laws surrounding God's love Mm -hmm. have all been specifically created to help us get to this point of recovering from our injury, from Mm. from how we've injured ourselves and how others have injured us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in, in this process of recovery, the laws play a large part. And so God designed this framework, Mm -hmm. which is a, a very loving framework that has been created to allow us 
to go through the processes of forgiveness and repentance. Mm. Mm. So that's not just the specific uh, law, say, of compensation that we've spoken about. We'll, no. we'll have the chance to speak about it more generally as a framework, won't we? Yes, it's sort of like, you know, there are other laws too. You know, obviously all the laws that apply to forgiveness and repentance are also a framework. Mm -hmm. And then there's the laws that apply to a reception of God's love that's a framework. Uh, so that you could say the total framework is quite complex and, and all motivated towards bringing a person into a state of awareness and then into the process. And the, the framework is a very clear framework that God had designed specifically for the soul to go through because God knew that by giving us free will, he is also giving us the potential to make choices that harm ourselves and harm others. Yeah. And, and he also then needed, if he was going to create a perfect system, he needed a way to recover from that harm, mm -hmm. both to recover from the harm we do to ourselves and recover from the harm we do to others. And so the laws create this framework. And there are literally thousands of different laws that apply to the recovery of the soul. And we've discussed a few of the large ones. You know, we've mentioned them in previous discussions, even mm -hmm. like the law of cause and effect, the law of compensation, the law of attraction yeah. and so forth. These are these are la laws or groups of laws that bring the soul into this state of awareness and eventually into a state of healing back to what you know could be our pristine condition if we had not have chosen to sin mm. yeah mm. okay um so that's third and fourth what was the fourth way we're going to discuss god's involvement well the fourth way is probably uh, an, another thing to do with god's creation and that is how god created the soul itself mm. it's one thing to create a structure of law quite another to have the structure of law interplay with the soul and its design mm. so so you could say that it's a bit like um, you know, when, a, when a human being designs a car, for example, we, we put a steering wheel in it you yes. know, uh, because it, it, it interplays with our hands and the way we control our hands. And, and then there had to be f controls for acceleration, brake and other things. And our hands are already you know, involved <laughs> in the steering. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we put you know, an accelerator and foot controls. So you could say all those controls are all interfaces between how the human being operates and then how the car operates. Yeah. So the human being can control the car and, and the, the car had some feedback mechanism to the human being. Mm -hmm. in, in a similar, uh, that's a very rudimentary example, but in a similar way, God designed the soul to interface with the law. Mm. So, so the laws have an effect on the soul. If, if the laws had no effect on the soul, there would be no point in creating them. Yeah. So, so when God designed the human soul and he designed the framework, he had to create them in such a way that the framework of the laws and the principles all interface with the soul itself. Mm. And the soul is able to respond to that, to that interface. And so that's the fourth way, the fourth mm. group of methods, if you like, that God uh, utilizes to help us through the process of forgiveness and repentance. And in fact, to help us through any process mm. by creating this interface, if you like, where the soul is capable of feeling the effects of the law. Mm. Um, because if it didn't feel the effects of the law, then it would be like the law does not exist. Mm. Mm. And part of that interface or interrelationship between the working of the law and the working of the soul, part of it is sort of under control of our desire, but the other parts are just under control of our will. We have no... Um, personal choice in the matter. It's operating on our current state as it is right now. Yes, and it's really interesting that yes. certain laws interface with our desire, mm -hmm. in other words, interface with the faith, the level of faith we have. And then there's other laws that interface with our will, which is our current condition. So, so it's interesting mm -hmm. that there are two, like the way the laws have been designed, one group of laws correct the condition by force, if you like, or, yes. or, or by pain and suffering. Mm -hmm. The other group of conditions uh, correct the condition by desire, which is, a, which is a far more loving process, actually. So, so the way God designed it was even if we're stubborn and resistive, <laughs> we will still change. Yes. But, but better than that, uh, once we stop becoming stubborn and resistive, yeah. we have the likelihood of changing more rapidly and also being happier while we do it. Yeah. Mm. And it's kind of a light bulb moment in one's progression when you realise, I've been stubborn about this, but I have a different choice. And that immediately means 
the the recognition that the old way doesn't work and then there might be a different choice that I can engage based on desire yes. immediately causes a change in that interface, doesn't it? Yes, and even the way the soul, as we've discussed a little bit down the track, and um, the way the soul has been created to be emotional is mm -hmm. a is a large uh, has a large bearing on this process because if we didn't have an emotional response to what happened to us, and um, then you could say it would almost be robotic, wouldn't we, with everything? Yeah. Everything would just be cause effect, cause effect, but there being no emotion involved. The emotion involved actually causes a lot us to both experience pleasure, but also to properly be able to be become sensitive to pain and therefore unsensitive to what is going wrong, mm -hmm. and therefore having a desire to correct it. So it's very important to become sensitive emotionally, and this is why we've spent a lot of time with people trying to help their sensitivity to emotion grow. Yeah, mm. fantastic. Well, as we go through it, I'll pick up on a lot of those points with you again. Mm. Yeah. yeah. How God gives me personal assistance to forgive and repent. So this was the first of the four ways that God uh, assists us in this process of forgiveness and repentance. So mm. um, what are the ways we can engage with this direct personal assistance from God? Well, obviously, uh, we've already learned about one of the primary ways in the in the process of discussing the conscience. Mm. So the conscience is a mechanism via which God built into the soul, via which God can communicate truth to every single human, independent of every other human. Mm. So so this is the first one of the first primary ways that God actually has a direct method of helping us get to the stage where we're seeing what we need to forgive and seeing what we need to repent for. Mm -hmm. Without that way, it would be very, very difficult for God to, or for us to engage the next way. Yes. So, so we, so this first way, which was the, the, the leading us to truth method that God has, mm -hmm. and, and it's the direct way that God leads us to truth. And makes us aware of truth. Yeah. Isn't yeah, it? yeah. That's right. So, so this is the very first way that we usually experience in our life where God is having a direct influence in our life. Mm -hmm. Once we've gone through that first way to a degree, we learn about the truth of receiving God's love. Mm. So the, receiving God's love is the second way. And the second method, so the second way that God helps us directly is by allowing the human soul to be the receiver of a substance of God. In other words, it allows the human soul to become more godlike. Mm. And in the process of becoming more godlike, we become more sensitive to what God feels is right and wrong about matters. And therefore, we become more sensitive to what we need to repent for and forgive. Mm. Now, we've discussed that more in more detail now yeah. for each particular point. But it's just basically those two methods that God has for with us for, that are direct relationship based methods with God. So there's the conscience, which is transferring truth, and um, God's love, which transfers love. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, the connection with the Holy Spirit, which transfers love. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How God via the conscience helps me forgive and repent. So let's talk now about that first what direct way God assists us. Mm -hmm. How does the conscious conscience help me to forgive and repent in my life? Well, obviously, we've uh, just had, you know, from nine, session nine to session 13. So what's that? 19, 11, 12, 13, five sessions on the conscience. So, you know, it would pay for people if they, if they, if they don't understand how that works by now, they, they yeah. probably need to go back and re-watch those particular sessions. And we did address that question very directly in those sessions, didn't <laughs> we? We did, yeah. yes. So just basically, the conscience is a mechanism designed within the human, so that God designed and placed within the human soul that allows every single soul, and, and, and remember that it's every single half of a soul, mm. actually. Mm. So it's a, the conscience has been, is a part of each half of the soul as a mechanism, and it allows every single half of the soul to be able to connect directly with God's truth. So it's a very, uh, it's a beautiful mechanism that actually when the soul joins becomes even more intense. Mm. So once the soul joins, it's like the two halves of the conscience mechanism also join. So, so that's a, also a very powerful thing to, to have happen. So, so the conscience mechanism itself allows now for God to transmit truth to the soul. Now, of course, there's certain limits the soul can place on it. 
but the conscience mechanism is always going to work because mm. it, it's God's designed it to work. Mm -hmm. So it always is working. There's no way to stop it from working. Yeah. But but we can detune from it, mm. obviously. So we've talked a lot about how we detune, what causes us to detune, how we can re tune yes. our <laughs> conscience back, you know, so it's more operational. Yeah. Um, the reality is it always operates, but it, it, it's the sensitivity and the willingness to listen to it that mm. we have control over. The more we're willing to listen, the greater good it can do us. Yeah. The less we're willing to listen, the less effect it has on our lives, obviously. But it has that benefit of it's always operating, so it's always going to tell us when we're sinning or when someone sinned against us. Yes, and, and most importantly, it tells us what God feels about that sin mm. and what God feels about what we should do. Mm -hmm. that, that's very, very different than having a person tell you mm -hmm. what you, know, you should or shouldn't do. You, you, God is very accurate in God's truth in the sense that you know, it's very refined and, and God is very specific with us when it comes to the conscience. And, and and in some ways, the you know God can be more direct with us than even the laws can be mm. in that regard, because He can preempt the uh, laws to a degree by telling us this is what's going to happen if you do that. Yeah. Even so, so you know God has a, a great way of helping us here through the conscience that can prevent our pain and suffering, mm. whereas the laws are there just responding to things, and therefore they may cause pain and suffering because when I say they may, you know, obviously it's our actions that cause the law to respond in a corrective manner. Yeah. Um, whereas God can say, no, you're about to do this. Yeah. And it's not such a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can say that through the conscience. Whereas, whereas the laws can't say that. Mm. The laws can only go, it's happened now. This is the result. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And so, you know, we, we need to understand the difference there. The conscience is a powerful mechanism to prevent our pain. Mm. But unfortunately, most people on earth still see it as a mechanism causing their pain, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> not seeing that their own actions are what causes their pain. Mm. But it, it's very important that people understand, too, that it's God's feelings, not your feelings. Mm -hmm. so, so the conscious mechanism is transmitting to you God's feelings about the matter, God's thoughts about the matter, you could say. Because the way God thinks is is also how God feels. Yes. Right. Yeah. So so when God transmits thoughts to us, our feelings they are based upon God's feelings about things, and and also they all contain logic. In other words, there's a reason why God feels that way about that thing, mm -hmm. right? And and that can even be transmitted via the mechanism of the conscience too. Yeah. So the conscience is a very powerful tool that God inbuilt into the soul. And remember, God is the person giving it truth. It's not some internal thing saying, I know that's truth and I know this truth. Yeah. No, it's not like that at all. It's no, God is transmitting this truth. So if two people have a conscience that's working, mm -hmm. they will receive the same truth about the same action. Yeah, There's no doubt about that because God's opinions don't differ for different people on the same action. Yeah. So, so the, you know, this is a... The beautiful thing about the conscience, we're getting exactly God's opinion about the matter, mm -hmm. not what we would like to believe. Yeah. When we go and get advice from people, we're often seeking advice that's in approval for our already held belief. Mm -hmm. That doesn't happen with the conscience. With the conscience, frequently it's giving us advice that is completely the opposite yeah. of what we believe we should do yeah. or what we believe is right or wrong. So, so, you know, this is the, it's the sign the conscience is working frequently. It will disagree with you <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> because it's God's truth. It's, uh, God disagrees with us. You know? Rats, <laughs> I'm being told something else. Yeah, yeah, and that's frequently what it's like. Yeah. So the conscience is a very powerful personal mechanism that God has available to him to help us to, you know, get to the state of forgiveness and repentance. Mm -hmm. Obviously, when it relates to forgiveness and repentance, we can see that God can show us what we've done wrong mm -hmm. and therefore what we need to repent for. And God can also tell us what other people have done wrong accurately mm -hmm. so we know what we need to forgive. And because it's God's opinion, we know it's right. Yeah. We don't have to say, oh, you know, maybe this is wrong because it might be just their opinion. No, yeah. it's God's opinion. Therefore, it is the truth of the universe. It's yeah. not 
it's not just a personal opinion from mm -hmm. God's perspective. There's, a, there's, there's laws and principles all based around why God's saying it's wrong as well, mm. which, by the way, we can also receive well, through the mechanism of the conscience. It's kind of mind-boggling because if, if I really seek to hear the messages of the conscience, I'm going to receive a very detailed and complex sort of nuanced answer about what is the right loving thing versus the unloving sinful thing and the reasons why and the complex interplay of emotional conditions of everyone around me and the implications of a certain action in the long term and the short term like i'll be receiving a lot of information mm, yeah very and, quickly <laughs> yes and, and obviously when you're at one with god in love then your conscious mechanism isn't isn't f flawed in any way in mm -hmm. the sense that you haven't you, you're not detuning from it anymore so now every nuance can mm. be received, although the nuances depend upon your development still, mm. because, you know, obviously our ability to absorb truths of a higher nature depend upon our education. Yes. You know, we can't be completely lacking in education and then expect to receive the highest truths of the universe. That's not how it works. It's like, you know, you need to grow into certain things in order to grow it in order to get the capacity to receive certain types of information mm. this is this is interesting and probably we didn't touch on this that much in the conscience discussions but it's it is almost like a uh, muscle as that i'm growing uh, the through my development of the factors that we spoke about uh, mm -hmm. that i need to develop in order to become sensitive to the conscience in the first place mm -hmm. Uh, obviously what you're saying now is the continued development of those qualities and my continued desire and aspiration to be in tune with God's truth about issues is going to grow my awareness or is it well, just my soul-based development? Yeah, once we hit the point of at one moment with God, you could say that there is no impediment in your conscience. Mm -hmm. However, your soul's ability to understand the truth it receives still needs work. Yes. Because obviously you're still a finite being and God's an infinite being. being. Being infinite, God has an infinite amount of truth. Often that truth is very complex in nature and our soul is not yet at the development where it can even understand the truth it's receiving. Mm. So, so even though the conscience mechanism is now being perfected, all of, the, all of the impediments to its operation are now being removed by yep. the time you reach it one with God, you still are in a condition where even though you're capable of receiving the truth on a certain matter, you don't know much about the truth you're receiving uh -huh. because God's truth is infinite in nature and your soul's finite. You still have limitations placed upon what you know, and therefore you need to build upon this foundation now and, and to get more and more truth mm -hmm. and to understand more and more truth. You need to understand what questions you need to ask now. Yeah. And, and that requires developmental experience within the soul after you become at one with God. So, but does that same principle apply before I'm at one with God? Um, to, a, to a degree, of course, mm -hmm. it, it applies to all of your soul development. You mm -hmm. know, a baby cannot, you know, when it first born cannot walk. It needs to go through a process of development. A, 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 a young child that's now just learnt to walk, let's say from nine to 15 months of age, it, it doesn't have to, it can't do algebra. Yeah. You know, because yeah. it hasn't learnt that yet and it, hasn't, it doesn't know how to do these particular things yet. You know, by the time a, a child is developed to a, to a degree, and this is also what my comments here are notwithstanding spirit overcloaking and other things. Yeah. Obviously, that has an effect on the children and how they operate. But, but assuming the child is not, has no spirit influence whatsoever, by the, child, by, the child, by the time the child is four or five, it, it still doesn't have sexual awareness or sexual mm -hmm. development very much. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, often, you know, nowadays we go through that through puberty, through the puberty process. Yeah. So, so you can see that everything is a stage of growth. Yes. And that applies, of course, to the operation and development of the conscience while we're growing. Yeah. But once we get full grown, as, the saying, as mm -hmm. the saying would be, and in my mind, full grown is once you've become at one with God, you're now sort of full grown in the sense of the way your conscience is now functioning mm -hmm. in the sense that there's no impediments to its operation mm -hmm. you still have soul development to do yeah because you're a finite being and god's an infinite being mm -hmm. and you're working towards that infinite so Stay. 
if it, yeah so so obviously there's still developmental work that's going to happen and certain truths that god's trying to going to transmit to you even after you become at one with mm-hmm. god you won't understand yeah. because you're yet to you know have the ability in your soul you've yet re- to receive enough of god's love to even grasp the truth of it so um just to use a, a quick analogy then um, you mentioned the issue of a child and sexual development. So I understand there's limitations in this question, but just to try to understand the concept you're saying as an analogy, uh, say I'm a five-year-old with a well-developed connection to my conscience uh, and there's some kind of sexual behaviour or some kind of sexual advance made towards me. I may not understand conceptually what sexuality is or or why even this is wrong but I have a feeling this is not the way to go I don't understand everything about it but I know it's not the way to go that's right so it, that's similar to what you're saying sort of even at an one condition I can feel God's feelings about something but I may not understand fully why, why? and the wherefore of all of the why that's right yeah, and, and it requires knowledge, yes. further development yeah. to come to understand the why Yes. The, the nuances of the truth yeah. require further development. And that means soul development. So, mm-hmm. so soul development, which is, which is looking at the development of your emotional sensitivity, your development in love, the reception of God's love, the way your soul transforms technically when you receive God's love all needs to happen over a period of time in order for you to now understand what properly what's being said to you mm-hmm. so while god can transmit yes and no's yes <laughs> questions and answers to you obviously god can't give you uh, answers around the complexities of the universe mm-hmm. that your soul is yet to develop a desire to know for or the capacity to understand mm-hmm. so this requires further development so that yeah. that's always going to be the case but you could say at the time of one minute, your soul is perf- your your conscience mechanism is mm-hmm. per- perfected, mm-hmm. and and in that in that regard, when it comes to developing this, this forgiveness and repentance side of thing, which mm-hmm. is what we're talking about here, by the time you reach at one minute, you've forgiven everybody you need to forgive, mm-hmm. and you've repented for everything you need to repent for. Mm-hmm. So that you could say that the conscience, when it's become perfected, also results in a perfected state when it comes to forgiveness and repentance. Mm. You no longer, you, you are now going to forgive everything. Yeah. And you are now also no longer going to need to repent for anything. Mm. So that, that shows us very mm. clearly the relationship between the conscience and forgiveness and repentance. The more that I develop my connection to the conscience, the more I'm going to be engaged in this forgiveness and repentance process and they're working together. That's so right. that by the time of it, one month, I'm perfected in both things almost. That's right. Yeah. Your conscience is now perfected in the sense that you can receive any kinds of truth from God as long as you have the capacity to ask. Yeah. And and your your forgiveness and repentance processes have now been completed mm-hmm. because you now no need to for, you, you now forgive everything and you now no longer need to repent for anything because you you now no longer do anything wrong yeah. from God's perspective. <laughs> yeah. And that's because of you're so in tune with your conscience and you're so in tune with God's love now. Mm-hmm that both the conscience and God's love preclude you from now taking these actions that you would have otherwise taken mm. in, a, in, a, in a darker condition. Mm. Mm. Excellent. But the conscience, yeah, the v- a very important personal mechanism that God has the ability to share truth via, via this mechanism. Mm-hmm. And, very, and it's, a, and it's a, the very first way that we start to engage God directly. Mm-hmm. And those processes of forgiveness and repentance, because I know this was wrong, this was right. That's right, and yeah. and it's not you know. Yeah, yeah. It's God knows, and I want to know from and God. And I want to know, <laughs> you know, what God knows. Yeah. So it's not it's not so it's more of a God reliant process. It's mm-hmm. not I know I did wrong. Mm-hmm. It's there's a most of the things that we need to repent for. We don't know we're yeah. doing wrong. Yeah. Like you know when we first discuss discussed addictions with people. People just looked at us like we were quite crazy, you know. Of course, you get your addictions met, you know. What I mean? yeah. <laughs> there, there's not a knowledge there mm. that it's wrong from God's perspective, mm-hmm. and this is how it is light for for the majority of us. Without that conscious mechanism, we would just keep on agreeing, uh, you know, either agreeing with the mass mm-hmm. of people or having our own personal opinion about what is right and wrong, and that's not the conscience, obviously. Mm. 
And, and obviously that's not going to help us forgive or repent yeah. if we have just our own personal opinions, because our personal opinions are frequently flawed when it comes to the correct view of love. And God has the correct view of love. Mm. And God's truth is all about God's truth about the correct view of love. <laughs> love. And so we'll talk a bit later about, you know, engaging forgiveness and repentance independent of God. But basically what you're saying is if I want to get it right, then knowing from God these things is the way to most swiftly engage forgiveness and repentance. Of course, it makes it a lot easier, which yeah. we'll talk about more later. Yeah, hmm. yeah. Okay. Hmm. How God's love helps me to forgive and repent. So this is the second personal way that you mentioned um, that God assists us in this process. How does God's love and the reception of God's love assist me to forgive and repent? Well, obviously God's love is a substance of God's divinity in now being received by our soul, as long as we have a sincere desire and longing to receive it. Mm -hmm. And we're willing to get into a state of truth mm -hmm. in order to receive it. There has to be both occurring. Now, the conscience has helped me get into a state of truth mm -hmm. so I know about it and at least can develop some sincerity about receiving it. Mm -hmm. So that's fantastic. That part has happened. So assuming that's happened, and I now have this, um, the, the longing that's starting developing inside of me. Mm -hmm. So I start to long for God's love from my soul, not just from an intellectual state anymore. So now that I've got this longing, God's love starts entering me. What does it do to me? Well, it does a number of things from a technical perspective, a mechanism perspective, mm -hmm. as well as an emotional perspective. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so we need to have a look at what it does mm -hmm. to us. Firstly, it, it, it makes me more sensitive to sin. In other words, more sensitive to do, doing an unloving thing. So, so that has a powerful effect on me. I, obviously, if I'm more sensitive to doing an unloving thing, I find it harder to do the unloving thing. Mm -hmm. Now, how has that helped me forgive and repent? Well, not only do I find it harder to do an unloving thing, I start to see all the unloving things mm. that I have done. Yeah. And I start to see the unloving things other people do mm -hmm. as well, because I'm more sensitive to sin. I'm more sensitive to unloving acts. So can we just clarify quickly why receiving God's love makes me more sensitive to sin? And again, I've got an analogy in mind. Mm -hmm. Tell me if you uh, agree. So it's almost like um, sitting here in sort of a grey, darkened room. And then um, I know that the, the switches in here are on dimmers. So I know that I can, there's a maximum amount of brightness and I'm, I'm aware of that, I'm comfortable with that and I'm sure that that exists and I think that's really bright. And then there's a, a level of dimness <laughs> that I can turn the lights down to and that's pretty dark and you can't really see much. And so if we, if we talk about love and sin so in those ways. So we talk about that from a moral and ethical yes. perspective. There's a certain amount of bad behaviour that you'll get to the point where you can't tolerate. Yeah, and, and I'm sensitive to that. And yes. you're sensitive to that. Yeah. And there's a certain amount of good behaviour that you get to the point where you can't tolerate any more than that either. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. So, but when I receive God's love, it's like taking the roof off on a really bright summer day here and suddenly there's all this light and I'm aware, my gosh, that, that maximum amount of brightness that I thought was achievable that was nothing. Mm -hmm. There's a huge amount more love mm -hmm. or happiness that's possible. And now that that's happened, I'm suddenly more sensitive to the aspects of the darkness that exists as well. Is, is that a good analogy? Um, I think probably the better analogy is that is the brighter the light gets, the more you see. Mm -hmm. so, so obviously, if you're sinning and you're turning up the light, you know, usually yeah, so, so sin and darkness to a large degree is joined together in, mm -hmm. in, in even the psyche of humans because yeah. oftentimes we do a lot more sin when people can't see. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And that's a general truth. You know, yeah. we, we, if we think we're going to get away with it, mm -hmm. we often do th worse things than if we think we're not going to get away with it. Mm -hmm. if, we, if someone's going to shine the light on what we do, yes. um, we probably will be more, you know, resistive to doing it yeah. uh, and more more like thinking, oh, maybe it's not such a good idea. Be but it's mostly because of shame or, mm. or it's not because of in the heart we really feel that we shouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. We'd like to do it, you know, but but 
the world's not really going to let me get away with that yeah, type yeah, of thing is yeah. the way we normally feel, right? So, so sin and darkness are often synonymous for that reason. Doing things in the darkness means that people can't see what I do. Mm. And, and so if you can imagine turning up the light where now everything that is done is also seen. Mm -hmm. and, and you could say this is really what God's love does to our souls. Well, once we, as we receive more of God's love, it's like the brightening of a room where initially everything's dark and we can't really see anything. Mm -hmm. So there's no real detail, there's no real outline, there's no uh, understanding of really what's in the room. And frequently in our life, we are basically feeling our way through our life. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a bit like f feeling your way through a darkened room where there's no light and you've got to, you know, you, you put your hands out in front, making sure you don't hit anything and that kind of sort of feeling. Mm -hmm. This is how most of us finish up living our lives. But if you turn up God's love, in other words, we receive more of God's love in our soul. It's like turning up the light in the room. We mm. see more. And, and, and the, as that light increases, so too does our ability to see everything around us and what's really going on around us. So it's not only what's going on within me mm -hmm. that's, that's now like exposed, yeah. but it's also what's going on around me mm -hmm. that's exposed. So now I see when others sin, mm. and I also see when I sin, mm. uh, whereas before I might not have seen either mm. of those things. And it, I see it, don't I see it because there's a contrast between what I thought, I just, I just know from when I met you, no one had loved me in the way that you love me. And it suddenly made me aware, my gosh, all these things that were happening in my life that I thought were just normal, that, that that wasn't so good for me. It, it, now it mm. hurts when I feel about those things, whereas before I wasn't sensitive to that. And mm. somehow I relate that to the reception of something purer, heightening my awareness of the contrast between other things. Well, it's very similar with God. Obviously, God's love is the purest. Mm -hmm. so, so the more you receive God's love, it's the same effect on your soul. You start seeing a lot of things. Of, wow, this is how God's love feels. Mm. This is how God loves me. And then I look at how, you know, I love others and how they love me. Mm -hmm. And I go, wow, in comparison to how God's loving me, that's completely different. Mm. So obviously now I've got a disparity. Mm -hmm. So now I can see the disparity. I can now see the sin. So this is how the reception of God's love makes me more sensitive mm. to sin. Yeah. yeah, it's a natural process mm -hmm. that happens to everybody who receives God's love mm -hmm. consistently. Mm -hmm. yeah. So then by being more aware of sin, I now know, oh, goodness, there's something I did wrong there, or oh, now I feel that someone did something wrong to me there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. The next way is a way about emo how it makes us emotionally sensitive. Mm -hmm. see, see, a lot of the things we do, we're, we're not sensitive to the pain of it. Mm. And this is something, you know, I've been encouraging you to do, is get more and more sensitive to the pain of what's happening yep. in, a, in your life. And, and this is a very, very important process to become more sensitive to the pain in your life. And, you know, unfortunately, what happens with most people is we desensitize from the pain in our life. And this causes us to, to live with more pain. Yeah. We, 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 it's sort of like the, probably a good analogy there is like a frog, you know, mm -hmm. sitting in a f cold water that's put on a stove, yeah. you know, and the stove is, is put on heat. And as the water heats up, the frog won't jump out because he's, because he's become detuned. It's a gradual change. It's a gradual change. Of rising of the heat. And, and by the time he, he like... The frog doesn't notice. The yeah. frog doesn't notice the difference. And by the time he should have jumped out, he's dead mm -hmm. because, he, because he's allowed this process of desensitization to occur for such a long period of time. Yeah. And this is frequently what we do as humans. We're desensitizing to pain. Mm -hmm. We're becoming emotionally insensitive. Mm -hmm. And as a result of becoming insensitive, we need, you know, we, we become harder. We're like a rock. You know, we, we, nothing can permeate us and get us to move from our position. And frequently you find that. So, so how do we become more sensitive? Well, the heart of a rock has to be turned into the heart of a stone, of the flesh. <laughs> yeah. You know, so if instead of being a stone, it has to be flesh. Yeah. It has to feel things. And, and God's love helps us to feel things. Mm. Yeah, God feels everything. Yeah. And we'll talk more about how, uh, why God feels everything later mm -hmm. uh, in our next session. But, 
you know, God feels everything and, and God's designed the human soul to feel everything as well. Because remember, we were made in God's image. Mm -hmm. So so it's not like we're turning God into an anthropomorphic God. Yeah. We're actually saying, no, we were made in the image of God. God's a feeling being. He is, a, he is the most sensitive being in all existence. Mm -hmm. We need to become more sensitive. Mm if we're going to get closer to God. Now, receiving God's love causes us to be more sensitive. The more sensitive we come, the more open we are to pain mm -hmm. and suffering, both in ourselves and others. We can start to see the causes of pain and suffering, yep. and therefore we want to engage them less, yep. those causes. And uh, this is a very, very good thing. And also we can see the results of our uh, why we're in so much pain and suffering from our prior history. Yeah. which is all about forgiveness and repentance. Yeah. So we start seeing, ah, oh, the reason why I'm in pain about this is because I haven't forgiven that yet. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I'm in pain about this is because I haven't repented for that thing that I do all the time. Yeah. And we start to become more sensitive as a result of this growing emotional awareness that mm -hmm. is a part of receiving God's love. It seems to me that uh, you mentioned the frog in the, in the saucepan, but it seems to me that... Um, by seeking God in this process of forgiveness and repentance and, and hopefully receiving some of God's love, the, we become suddenly more sensitive to the heat in the water, if you mm. use the same analogy, mm. uh, much more rapidly. And we're f it's like the, um, the a princess and the pea. Jump out, you know? Yeah, the, the <laughs> old fairy tale of the princess and the pea. You know, she yeah. had the feather bed and there was just one pea underneath all these mattresses. And, and, and mattresses, and she still feels the <laughs> pea. She could still feel the pea because she was very sensitive and in tune. And, yeah. and I think... Um, when there isn't this this sense of contrasts, it's the the new normal never happens. Everything is just kind of normal. Pain is normal for most people on the planet. Some level of discomfort and pain, mm. which is why we have such a society in the West that's driven by addiction, like uh, yeah. anything to get away. Yeah, frequently, I you know some guys you know I've talked to uh, in the past, you know they've said to me, oh I don't feel much physical pain. I don't really know what you're talking about. And yet you just poke them in a certain area of their body and they jump through the roof. You know, it's like they didn't know that was there. Now, yeah. why? Because they have desensitized to it. That's yeah. why. Yeah. So they're not, we're not even sensitive to the pain in our physical body, let alone the pain in our soul. Yeah, and that's, that's I think, the thing that I think about is that, well, I'm sensitive to a certain level of pain right now, and I think it's a problem. If I was to receive God's love, what would I suddenly feel was painful? Yeah. It's going to be quite different. I can choose to engage this process of trying to do forgiveness and repentance on my own with the level of pain that is currently too uncomfortable for me. But if, if I involve God in this process, both through the conscience and through receiving God's love, suddenly I'm going to feel, hang on, there's a lot more pain in my life. And there's a lot more to forgive and repent for, and it becomes more economical, doesn't it, in the way that I do it? It does. A lot of people might see that as a disadvantage, you know, Probably. suppression of pain. But but the reality is, if you're not sensitive to pain, you will not change. Yeah. So so you know, frequently people live with high concentrations of pain for long periods of time without change, and that eventually causes their death. So yes, and compounding pain. Yeah, and yeah. and worse pain. Yeah. So so you know the rea by not being sensitive to the small amounts of pain, mm -hmm. you eventually have to tolerate larger and larger and larger amounts of pain, which you also try to desensitize to. Mm -hmm. Eventually, there's so much pain that you die, yeah. and, but you're still in all that pain. Yeah. So when you pass, you've still got all this pain, but and and you're still trying to desensitize to it, but it's there. You know, mm -hmm. you, there's nothing you can do to it. Do about it now. It's there. You put it there through your actions and behaviour and other people put it there through theirs that you haven't forgiven. And and as a result of this lack of forgiveness that you've engaged and lack of repentance that you've engaged, you now end up in this extreme amount of pain, which is how many people end up when they pass mm. in, in quite extreme amounts of pain, which take many years and often centuries to relieve. Mm. Now, it doesn't have to be that way. If we were very sensitive, like the princess and the pea, mm -hmm. we were very sensitive to the smallest amount of pain, then there's a higher likelihood we'd change our behaviour just with that small amount of pain, particularly when we know mm. that behaviour is linked to a certain unloving act that we are personally engaging. Because the conscience, remember, is already telling me yeah. that. So, so it can show me what, yeah. what, what, what's going on and mm -hmm. why 
I feel the pain I'm in. Yeah. So, so it's actually better to get more sensitive yes. to pain. You, ironically, even when it comes to physical pain, what do people do? Yeah. Pill pop, you know, you know, painkillers are one of the biggest items on sale anywhere mm -hmm. in the world. Mm -hmm. The reason why is because we're addicted to avoiding pain. Mm -hmm. But then when it comes to emotional pain, what do we do? Well, it's the same thing. We yeah. try to find a pill for it. We try to find... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I read something recently about um, people using, trying to use anger as an analgesic, like as a painkiller. You get hooked on the painkiller, which is anger, just to numb out to everything else that's underneath it. And yes, and pain, anger is a painkiller. Yeah. That's why we use it. Yeah. yeah. We don't want to tune into the pain underneath. Yeah. yeah. So we, we're doing the same thing all of the time. And what I think about now at this point is if I look at the princess on her, you know, wonderful eight very soft <laughs> magical uh, <laughs> mattresses with the one P underneath yeah. that she can't tolerate, if she just removes the one P, she's happy, she's laughing, she's in this beautiful bed, you know, and yeah. she feels wonderful. But if she ignores that P, then there has to be like a bag of P's and it's all pushing into it. And then if she ignores them, there has to be a boulder and she has to like try and move around that and get a neck cramp and all this. It's the same thing with and ignoring they, the pain. And keep on painting on more mattresses, which you could almost say yes. are, are our addictions that we're feeding, you know, yes. trying to avoid the pain. So we get more and more demanding for more things yeah, to soften but, it. But still, you know, sooner or later that, that problem is going to show through. We're just distancing ourselves from the problem. Mm. We're better off reconnecting to the problem. Yeah. And, and so we're far better off connecting to the pain than we are disconnecting from it. Yeah. And this is where I see many people make some huge mistakes when it comes to relationship with God. Instead of tuning into the pain of their current life, mm. they desensitize from the pain of their current life and then they say they don't need anything else other than what they're already doing to have a happy life. Mm. When, when, we look at, when you look at their life, it's quite clear that they're not happy. Yeah. And, and yet, you know, nobody wants to really come to terms with that. Yeah. It also seems that nobody wants to have the breakdown that they need to have. Yeah. Like every person on this planet has to go through a breakdown sooner or later. Yeah. And whether they go through it on earth or they go through it in the spirit world, it's going to happen mm. because you have to have this emotional breakthrough, which mm. feels like a breakdown. It feels yeah. like now you've gone from a point of control to out of control yeah. emotionally. And, and there will be a period of time where it feels like that for mm -hmm. every single person mm -hmm. eventually. And, and so what every person needs to do is get more sensitive emotionally. So, and, and if we were more sensitive emotionally, that wouldn't happen. Yes. That wouldn't need to happen. Yeah. But because we've desensitized, desensitized, covered over, covered over for years, years and years and years turns into a huge amount of baggage that now we've got to go through a breakthrough to get rid of it, <laughs> you know, a breakdown to get yes. rid of it. Um, and, and I feel we're pushing our planet to its very outer limits of capacity because we are so much into consumption to try to cover the pain that we're already in. Yeah, There's so to try much and prevent our own breakdown. <laughs> yes, to, pre to prevent the breakdown, I need another mattress, another mattress, and another iPhone, and another, you know, wardrobe, and, a, and another chocolate cake, and all these things. Yeah. Um, and it, that's getting us further away from the sensitivity, exactly. which is what the breakdown will force in us. Yes. If so God's love gets us closer to the, to the pain, which mm. is a very, very good thing, because mm. you get closer to the pain, and you're more sensitive to the pain, emotionally sensitive to the pain, now there's a higher likelihood you'll change your behavior yeah. voluntarily. Yes. <laughs> not, not by force anymore. Very good. Yeah. So we're only up to the second way that, or now we're up to the third way that receiving God's love helps us. Yeah, so the third way is about God's truth, mm -hmm. obviously. And if we've received some of God's love, there's changes that occur in the soul that make us more receptive to truth. Mm. Now, it doesn't guarantee we're going to receive or act upon the truth, mm -hmm. but it does open us to more truth. Mm. This is a very good thing because it means now we're even more sensitive to the operation of the conscience. Mm -hmm. It also means now we see the truth before mm -hmm. we didn't see it. Now, you can't change something you don't see. Yeah. So this is very important for your change to see things. And to see things, the more sensitive you are, you'll see more. Mm. So, so God's love transforms you enough to see more. Yeah. And so every little bit of God's love you receive causes you to see more, feel more, observe more. Mm -hmm. And all of that leads to sensitivity to sin, which is going to help us in forgiving and repenting. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. So very important part to be open to truth. 
in the process of having God's love re received, it brings us to the next thing, which is we now have a more sincere desire to love, mm. right? Because it's sort of like inside of us, we can feel, ah, oh, this feels really good. Mm -hmm. I would really like to be, to feel this more, mm -hmm. but also I'd like to share this kind of feeling more. Yeah. And so you, you're now more sensitive to love and what's not love. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a very important part of our development because as you know, the world itself is in a state of like believing its version of love to be love yeah. when its version of love is nothing like love and that's why we called it evil it's not like completely <laughs> reverse, reverse yeah. to love frequently right yeah. so so the problem with that is that because we're living in a state of evil mm -hmm. which is really in a lot of ways evil yes right just yeah. renamed yeah <laughs> and we're not sensitive to what love really is from god's mm -hmm. perspective and this causes us to live in states that we believe are loving that are actually quite disastrous. And that causes us to try and forgive others when they're actually doing the right thing. Doing the right thing, because <laughs> our evil says that's wrong. That's wrong, yeah. And, and also try to repent for things that are not wrong at all. No, that's yeah. right. You know, oh, I'm, I'm sorry I told you the truth. Yeah, I'm sorry <laughs> I told you the truth, that kind of thing. Oh, I can't tell them the truth. That's going to hurt them. Yeah. That, that yeah. kind of belief comes from evil. Like, yeah. And it creates evil. Yes. It creates evil behaviour. And that, you know, once we uh, become more sensitive to God's version of love, we start seeing that and mm -hmm. we start and we and being more sensitive to God's version of love, we can now go, oh, in the past, that's what I felt about that thing. Mm -hmm. But that's all wrong, mm -hmm. you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and I need to repent for that. Or in the case of somebody else, you know, in their accepting certain types of behavior. No, it's wrong for me to accept that mm -hmm. kind of behavior now. That's that's wrong. It's mm -hmm. not love to do that, you know. Mm -hmm. And so you stop accepting behavior that people feel should be acceptable. Yeah. And and this is because I'm now more sensitive to what love really should be. Yeah. Rather than what the world believes love is. Yes. And and this is going to be very very helpful in my desire to repent and forgive. Yeah. Very mm. good. All right, and uh, finally we had written there that receiving God's love helps us to uh, just want to remove the unloving parts of ourselves. Yes, and it's here we're talking about desire, mm. right? When, when you recognise something that's unloving inside of yourself, because remember that receiving God's love helps you recognise things that are now unloving, mm -hmm. whether it's in someone else or yourself, and also because it helps you more sensitive to the truth of what's loving and what's not loving. Mm -hmm. Now that we're more sensitive to what's unloving, we we now can also go, well, this is causing a lot of pain and suffering in my life and pain and suffering to other people. I, it'd be real good if I remove it. Now, what that does is it starts developing a desire from within oneself to go, wow, I'd really like to get rid of this. Mm. I, I really think it's important to get rid of this. It's no longer satisfactory for me just to accept what I've done in the past. Mm -hmm. I want to change this. And the desire to change something is, is a, will pay a large part in you going through repentance and forgiveness. Mm. And once you've gone through them, that thing will be changed. Mm -hmm. And once it's changed, you're now in a new state, mm. emotionally new state and, and, and from a love condition, new state. And these new states are obviously now going to help you accept more truth and more <laughs> love and, and, yeah. and so forth. So. You st once you start seeing that, you start having faith in the process. Most people who are hearing divine truth at this stage don't yet really have faith in the process because they're still arguing for their fears. Mm. So remember, fears are false beliefs appearing real. So, so they're still arguing for them. They still want to believe them. And mm -hmm. that's an indication that they're not yet in this state of desire for God's truth, which is God's truth is going to result in the removal of every one of your fears and, and frequently your fears are just a construct to help you believe some things that help you get away with unloving behavior. Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, by growing into this new condition, we will start realizing the very damaging effect of our fears mm -hmm. and the very damaging effect of believing them, mm. right? And acting upon them, which is what causes most of our unloving behavior. And so, so we'll see all of that and the more receive God's love. So receiving God's love is a very direct way yeah. that God has to help us move 
from a stubborn, hard hearted, you know, condition mm -hmm. into a nice, soft hearted, open, open minded condition where we can now see better what's really going on with ourselves and the world around us. Mm. Mm. So you just did a lovely wrap up, so I won't go, but there's a couple of times that I want to pick up on things that you mentioned just to clarify. Sure. So when I make a note, but, um, you can, you can do that now. All oh, right. Okay. <laughs> um, something you said about wanting to remove all the unloving parts of ourselves. I think it's very common that we think of the way that we are harming um, sinning things that we need to repent for as unloving parts of ourselves but it is also the case that when I seek to avoid forgiveness I'm also holding on to unloving parts of myself aren't yes, I very and much so. I just wanted to highlight that in the context because we're speaking about forgiveness and repentance that receiving God's love makes me want to remove all the unloving parts of myself which is not just ways that I'm actively seeking to harm others right now it's the way i'm it's also the areas where i'm avoiding where i have been harmed which yes. we know leads us to harm others but it's worth distinct having a distinction yeah if we look at the forgiveness issue specifically mm -hmm. um obviously when we refuse to forgive we basically believe we basically hold on to our rage anger and resentment for what others did to us mm -hmm. that's what we're doing mm. now now we do that in a lot of different ways we do that even through agreement mm -hmm. so we can actually even agree with how they treated us yes and, and and that's a way of avoiding the fact that we are really upset and angry about how they've treated us does or, that mean sense? yes it does and uh, sorry go on go on yeah um well it's also uh, you mentioned earlier about the fears um it's also where we can just say, oh, I'm just afraid when really we're just holding on to. Yeah, most most people I feel say they're afraid when they're really angry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> most of our beliefs that that we cho choose to co say are fears are really beliefs that we're stubbornly holding on to in our rage. Yeah, that's the reality. Yeah. Um, and and, you know, we're usually doing that because we haven't forgiven somebody in our yeah. past. So forgiveness certainly has has a huge effect if we haven't forgiven we're often in a very rageful state. Mm. On the other side, the repentant side, that's a lot about feelings of demand, superiority, feelings that we should have got what we didn't, you know, some, we should have got something that we didn't get, mm. that, that, you know, these kind of, these kind of feelings. Mm. And they also cause, if you think about it, a lot of our resentment and rage and other things like that. Mm. If somebody doesn't give you what you thought you deserved, you mm -hmm. know, Mm -hmm. That is often a, a of, often uh, a big point of anger with, within a person. Mm. So, so you can see in either direction. Yeah, there there is obviously some significant things that God's love is going to help us become sensitive to. Yes, and therefore instead of holding onto these false beliefs, which are going, no, this belief is good. This belief is good. Mm. You're going, hang a sec. No, this belief is completely false, and all this belief does is justify my rage. Mm. It justifies my unloving behavior towards other people. It justifies my stubbornness, justifies my withdrawal from humanity, justifies my, you know, desire to have other people responsible for me. It, you know, this is what it does. And all of that's unloving and mm. God's love helps expose all of that. Mm. Mm. And even you mentioned the agreement with the sin against me. That's a way of taking a painkiller sometimes it just helps me numb away from what's going on and i just say no that's right no that's right because it's harder to to fight against something than it is to just passively accept it yes you know as most people would be aware you yeah. know if if you've got to fight against something resist it rather than being just passively accepting it mm -hmm. most people eventually will, will go into just passively accept passive acceptance even though they are in a state of rage inside. Yeah. You see this a lot when you hold children that are out of control. If you hold them and bind them mm -hmm. to you, you know, so you're just holding them there, uh, often a child will go through a number of steps before mm -hmm. they get to their age. Mm. And one of those steps usually is a state of passiveness where they just go all floppy and they just go like that, you know, mm -hmm. hoping that that's going to mean that the oppression will stop. Yeah. And, and often in our life, going floppy does sometimes mean the oppression stops and so that's why we do it that's why we've learned to do it yeah 
it's not God's way, mm. you know, so obviously it's not going to work, but it is a way that we modify our feelings yeah. via, and, and also become less in tune with them. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, these are all things that God's love just exposes. Mm-hmm. You start seeing all these things in play in yourself and in others. Yeah, mm. yeah. All right, excellent. And you had a second question in the two, I think. Uh, no, that was that fine. Was, yeah, yeah. 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 So, so you can see, in summary, God's love is an essential part of God's direct help. Mm-hmm. You know, in fact, I feel those two things, the conscience with, with the mechanism of truth, God's mechanism of sharing direct truth with us, and God's love, like that's all a person needs yeah. in reality. To forgive and repent. To go through forgiveness and repentance. Yeah. If you focus your attention on those two things, you don't need all the other things God mm-hmm. has pr- provided, but, you know, God's still going to provide them because they are part of the structure that God has made. But these two things are the most essential things. Yeah. And yet I also see they're the two things that almost everybody ignores mm-hmm. on a daily basis. And so they're sort of almost forced into the next stage. Yeah. The indirect assistance that God has through other people or the assistance given through law or the assistance given through the mechanism of the soul, they have to now be engaged because we're ignoring the two most powerful methods yeah. of actually going through the process. Yeah. And, yeah. and this is the sad part of it is when we ignore God in the equation, yeah. we're now sort of consigning ourselves to a, a much more difficult process Uh, which is going to take a lot longer and result result in more pain and suffering Mm -hmm. than if we engage the more sensitive and more open process with God. And this is why, you know, to my mind, the relationship with God is the main process we need to focus our attention on Mm -hmm. and the relationship with the conscience and and receiving God's love. These are the things we need to spend more of our time on and, and, and less of our time on the other things. But but that's not generally what most people do because most people feel quite distant from God. Yeah. Most people feel like they can't break through these huge injuries that the planet has about God yeah. and, and they can't break through them personally. And so now, unfortunately, we've negated the effect of that personal relationship, that direct help. Mm-hmm. And now all of the help we can receive is indirect. Yeah. And that's pretty sad because yeah. it means it's not going to be as effective. Mm. as the direct help we could have received. Yeah. And um, as I was telling you, my new motto is go for the thing where there's the most resistance because logically there'll be the biggest results. That's right. Um, And so when we're so resistive to these two processes, if we can work through that, then obviously, as you've just pointed out, we're on our way in a lot of ways, aren't we? Yeah, in a lot of ways that motto is a very important motto to understand because it's really... It's really going to be that the, the, the things that we have the biggest resistance of mm-hmm. are resistance to God's view of love mm. and God's love itself and the relationship with God and the relationship with our other half. On the planet, they are the two biggest sources of pain and also the two biggest sources of all the trauma and suffering on the planet. Now, most people don't see the linkage there and, and you know, I can spend hours <laughs> discussing yeah. the linkage. But if we can just trust that if we can work through any issue relating to God first and any issue relating to the opposite gender or Mm -hmm. the same gender, you know, gender-based issues next, we are going to a large degree solve a lot of our problems right now, you know, as soon as we can possibly do. If we focus our attention on other things, then we are not going to solve our problems very rapidly. Mm. So, so unless you resolve your issues with the relationship with God and the issues with your relationship through with truth through the conscience unless you solve those particular two issues and spend all of your time and effort focusing on those issues unless you do that you are going to have a much slower process towards god there's Mm. no way that that can be avoided because you're now cutting off the primary source of help that you can receive Mm. 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 yeah all right well in our third part of this personal connection with God, we'll talk a little bit about how we can uh, yeah. facilitate that. Yeah. yeah.